to take the risk and to go further into like business ownership and specifically venue ownership, you have to be a little crazy and a little bit of a trailblazer to take on some of those risks and to also be able to say like, okay, I to let my numbers inform me of how I should price my venues and kind of, you know, use the matrix of like, okay, this is what my competitors are doing and this is how it compares to my cost of operation. But then really going into like, how is this cultivating the life that I actually want to live and what is important to me? Welcome to The Venue RX. On this show, we document and share best practices around owning, operating, and managing world-class wedding venues. What is up, everyone? John from here with The Venue RX, and today we have another one of our venue owner series. We have Mandy, the owner of Juniper Gardens, uh, 417, correct? Correct. Well, we just put that on the website to make sure people know where we're at. So 417 is the Southwest Missouri kind of area code. Um, the business is just Juniper Gardens. So, yeah. Amazing. Amazing. Well, Ma- Mandy, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for being here. I cannot wait to dive into your story. Um, looking at the website, we'll have links for that for everyone who's listening and watching and, and all that. But could you just, for anyone who is listening, maybe on Spotify or Apple, can you describe what the venue looks like? Yeah. Um, our venue is definitely a different approach than most. Like we were aiming for like, this 1950s national park, like roadside stop kind of feel, um, you know, evoking a lot of like the mid-century modern details, that sort of thing. It is not like the glitz, glam, um, pink kind of style of venue that, you know, a lot of people might be a little bit more familiar with. We definitely went more for um, not quite rustic, but also not quite, you know, perfect at the same time you know definitely going more for like the the nostalgia feelings and uh, so actually this might be a little off topic so our when we were building our first venue we did um our first wedding show like four or six weeks before our very first wedding and we're like crazy with like building and we're like out of money out of time out of energy but we we're like doing our first wedding show and trying to just put ourselves out there and get our names out there, but we were out of money. So we were like grabbing a lot of stuff from our house, you know, putting together this like the cheapest booth possible. Um, obviously we didn't get any leads from that. Um, but it was a good practice of like talking to people about our venue and like what that means for us. And then I, I took a picture of the booth and I posted it in like the wedding the owner Facebook groups. I can't remember which one. Um, and. <laughs> But somebody commented on there, like, it looks like grandma's house. And like, at first I was really offended by that. Uh, but now many years later, I've kind of embraced that. Like, yeah, it might look like grandma's house, um, but I want it to. And like, at, at first, like, I think a lot of people commenting on those things were trying to be super helpful of like, you know, that's not really like what wedding show booths look like. You know, you might want to look at this or might want to look at that. And they were being so kind and so helpful. Um, kind of dancing around the fact that they did not like my booth, but I was always the weird kid growing up. So like, why would business ownership and like my, you know, my building and my venue look any different than that? I'm still the weird kid. Um, and that comes out in my venue and like a long, a long way to answer your question of like who we are is, you know, we're a little bit different and we attract a lot of non-traditional couples because of that. And that's the point. Yeah. That's, that's very cool. And it, and it really sounds like probably the people that find you are obsessed with you, right? Yeah. It's usually like that. You know, you get people who really love us and that really connect with us and resonate with us or, you know, we're an immediate no for somebody. And that's great. You know, I try to make that really obvious on our website for people to kind of like, um, you know, I I don't, it's not that I don't want to talk to people. It's just, I don't want people to talk to me and spend their time with me if it's not a good fit for them. Um, because we are a little weird and a little different and I'm going to embrace that. And I hope the couples that find us also embrace that. You have on your website, something that really stuck out to me, uh, the fireplace, right? We have to talk. Ah. So how did that come about? Uh, why just give me, give me some details. Yeah. So the fireplace is an interesting story because, um, uh, you know, when my husband and I were getting married, we can find any venues that felt like us and like felt like a good fit for us. And that kind of like set us on this initial path of building our own wedding venue. 
And oftentimes we were just like on hiking trails, talking about like our dreams and ideas. And when we're, and oftentimes where we were hiking is down in like Ozark mountain trails down in Arkansas. Um, and you will find these old fireplaces out in the middle of nowhere. And we always kind of joke like, that'd be so cool if we could find some land that had that. We couldn't find any new land with that. So we were lucked out and found like a true stone mason. Like this is like a totally dying trade. Not many people do this anymore, but it's like real stone that has made up our fireplace. Um, but the, the poor guy got like COVID really bad during building it. Um, like he was gone for months and we were panicking. I'm like, are we going to have to learn stone masonry like a month before we open? Uh, because like he, he's in the hospital. Um, and then like got super sick right after he finished it, like the day after just crazy. Um, but it's now been kind of like this really sturdy foundation for a lot of like, we've had over a hundred ceremonies there in front of that fireplace now. And, you know, for me, I think about it as, you know, it's, it's, you know, you know, as the fireplaces on the hiking trail, like they've stood the test of time. Like they've been there for a hundred something years the building, everything else has fallen away from it, but it's embraced by nature. And like that, the symbolism that I wanted for marriages and, you know, the start of those marriages in our place is that it could just be embraced by nature. And it's, you know, the foundation is so thick, like it's going to outlast everybody the way that it was built. Um, so like that, I'm glad that that could be our anchor for our venue and kind of ha- evoke that kind of symbolism, whether people recognize it for that or not. But one thing that I see successful venues do is do that anchoring. They find something mm-hmm. or a few things maybe that their venue becomes known for. And then even if you can't remember, like in conversation, even if you can't remember the venue's name, it's like, oh, it's that one with the, the fireplace, the <laughs> fireplace. And it, it does. It anchors in people's minds when there's a prominent fixture like that. It's funny. There's a venue um, in, a, in a town over and you know, luckily we've got a really good community here in Southwest Missouri. It's a super intense competitive market, but we're all relatively like good friends. We all talk fairly regularly. Well, this other venue owner, she told me that she was working on developing another space um, to add to her venue and that somebody had sent her a picture of my fireplace that they had found on Pinterest um, and like, oh, you should do this. And she's like, this is like 20 minutes from us. I can't do that. It was just funny how it's like, you know, you never know. <laughs> Yeah, and and she was probably able to pick that out quickly because it's so signature for you guys. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And we had been friends for way before that, so it was just funny that we could have that conversation. I'm, I'm thankful that the local community is like that too with the local venues. I want to ask. I want to circle back around to that, but before we um, get to kind of talking about the wedding industry in general and and some of the things, I want to hear a little bit more about your story. Uh, you run the business with your husband, correct? Correct. Um, my husband jokes that he like built the buildings and then I built the business. Um, you know, so we've got my husband is a, a general contractor. So we're very fortunate in that regard that he has been able to build both our first location and is currently building our second indoor location as well. Um, and then I do a lot of like the day to day operations and marketing and all of the other aspects of owning the business. And then he just gets to come in and veto me every once in a while, you know. As any good husband does. <laughs> Anytime there's probably something that has a crossover with something structural at the, the property. Yeah, I was literally like sketching out how, like how I wanted like a kitchenette to work this morning. And he's like, that's no, that that doesn't work. And I was like, but you're supposed to just make it work. Like that's how this, I I, I dream it, you make it happen. But uh, I'm glad he's there to like bring me back to reality. That's cool. It's important to have both little dynamics. Yes. Uh, how how did this whole thing come about? I mean, I know you shared a little bit of the story, you know, some of the hikes and different things and, and the connection to the fireplace, but like why why the wedding industry kind of like what did you do professionally prior uh, to this? And um, give us your kind of professional journey up till up till now. Yeah, I mean, my journey probably started a little earlier than most, a little bit differently than most. I actually got pregnant in high school. I got pregnant at 16 and had my son. Um, so I was very early teen single mom and that kind of put up some guardrails for me and like what options were going to be available to me. 
um, as I entered adulthood and finished college, because I think initially, like if I did not have a child, I probably would have been an architect and had pursued that. Um, but that was just, I didn't want to spend that much time in school. And so I just kept making compromises and then still spent forever in school because I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. Um, and so I kind of fell into technical writing because it was the quickest program for me to graduate from, which, oh my gosh, like if you don't know what to do in school, like technical writing is where it's at because I was taking you know, graphic design classes and, um, you know, learning about Dreamweaver and InDesign and all of these things that are like so valuable to me as a venue owner that I would have to pay a lot of money to hire somebody to do these things for me. But I can just bring out my old textbooks and go through it all over again. So I'm so thankful that's what I did. Hated actually being a technical writer, though. You said technical writer? Mm -hmm. But So it, that sounds to me like you're writing, uh, not creatively, but technically? Is that, or am I getting it totally wrong? Yeah. Um, so that's essentially it. Um, so in the degree program, you know, we were learning a lots of different types of communication, like the persuasive communication, all of that. But what happened in like the actual corporate experience of that is I was actually, um, working with a financial software company and I was taking, you know, the, what the developers were doing and the changes that the developers were making to the software, translating that into plain English to then release to the end customer base. So they actually knew what was changed in the software. Um, so just taking a lot of really technical, complicated information and making it plain English. Right. And that's, so that, that's where Dreamweaver, InDesign, maybe yeah. also the Adobe Suite, some of those sorts of programs. Yeah. Yeah, so it all kind of like overlapped um, in school, which is when it was fun. In the career field, it was not fun. I'm also like not the best at grammar. Um, and so I did not do well in that career. Um, but that ended up evolving into project management, uh, which I actually um, still technically do um, work a day job as a project manager. Can't quite step away from that yet. Um, and then Outside of that, I always kind of had side hustles that, you know, ultimately ended up, I think, leading me to uh, venue ownership. But as a project manager, again, working with financial software, but on the side too, I was doing construction project management. My husband and I, um, after we met, we ended up renovating a lot of houses together. He was getting out of the farming industry, which of course requires a lot of um, just creativity and agility to kind of be able to fix it all, do it all. Um, and so we took that to renovating houses, which then allowed us to start building up equity and kept turning that into eventually us buying the land to build the venue. Um, so it was kind of a good combination of a lot of skill sets and a lot of passions um, where, you know, I was the little kid that like was playing Legos and like cardboard cities and like putting all this together. And I never really got away from, you know, the drawing aspect and like the building aspect. And I loved that. But then as I learned more about being a technical writer, bringing that to like, how can I cultivate a space to make a certain emotion? How can I make somebody feel super comfortable in this space? Like, I don't think I ever really was like, yeah, the wedding industry is for me. That's what I'm aiming for. It was more of like, this is the platform that I can really play around with. And I encourage conversation to happen in this space. Like, what can I change about it? to make somebody want to sit down and relax and talk. And like, it became that platform for doing that. And I've had so much fun trying to figure out how to play with design to be like, okay, how do we create this like anchor or this framework that can then be the backdrop of so many different love stories and look so authentic to that couple, but still is using the same framework. So that's kind of what really made me fall in love with this industry is just kind of bringing all of those skill sets together and really presenting it in a way differently, I guess. Hey there, pardon the interruption. I wanted to share with you about Weva. Weva stands for Wedding and Event Venue Association, and it's a brand new association just for venue owners and operators that we launched last year. It's been growing quickly since then, and we would love to offer an invitation to you to be a part of it. Weva is an association that is purpose-built for venue owners and operators to provide community, education, and networking opportunities just for our industry. We have a number of different resources, including networking, co-working events, uh, local meetups, and all sorts of different things. We will be having a large yearly event as well. We would love to have you part of the community, so please consider joining. We do have a link in the description below, or we will be linking it wherever you're listening to this. So please click on the link, check it out, and we would love to see you inside of Weva. 
Andy, this that that's really cool to kind of <laughs> the perspective of how you came with the industry. I want to ask you a question though that I I know venue owners struggle with because I've heard it you know a number mm-hmm. of different times. Um, just struggling with criticism of the venue, especially on tours and, <laughs> of people who maybe won't book right, but you know mm-hmm. they'll say something. And, and I think because venue owners just in general pour so much blood, sweat, and tears into it. You're, I hear what you, you know, after what you just told me, like the creativity, the passion, the intense interest in creating a space that is very intentional to serve, you know, couples and guests and things like that. But how do you handle when someone is kind of critical about the space or is maybe offering uh, unsolicited advice? I have come to, I had to come to peace with the fact that these people, when they're making these comments, I, I think it's genuinely coming from a place of love and respect. And it's been really hard. Um, so our, our original location is mostly a pavilion and then the fireplace for the ceremony space. The number of people are like, why don't you just put a wall up here? Because it happened to be windy that day. And I, it's hard for me not to explain to them the 40 different, you know, reasons of why we can't and like all the decisions and all the other thing scenarios we played out that ultimately landed us on that situation. Um, and they don't care. They don't care that, oh, if I build a wall here, it actually has to be able to withstand the wind load. It has to be aesthetically pleasing. I can't just throw up plastic and call that a, you know, an acceptable solution. Like I'm also creating trip hazards and all these other issues. But people will say things like that, like, oh, can't you just like put up a temporary wall or just throw out plastic? No, I can't. Um, so I'm not the best at handling those. I have had to really just smile and like, oh, thank you so much for your feedback. I appreciate that. And then, you know, a week later at my therapy appointment, like, you know, complain about it, um, which also I feel like for any business owner, therapy is key um, to not losing your mind because, yeah, people will make those comments and it really it's so hard, especially as a venue owner, when it is so much of your personality and your heart and soul in this business to separate, you know, yourself from the criticism of your business and to create that wall because in some regards you can't. Because you always have to have an element of yourself and your business because it's, it's who you are in some regards. But then putting up those safe boundaries of like, okay, they're going to have this feedback. They're not going to like this and just be okay with that. And I think that kind of goes back to like, I grew up as the weird kid. I'm still the weird kid and my venue is going to be the weird kid venue. And I have to be okay with that. Like when they said it when I was 12, it really hurt my feelings. They still say it when I'm 31 and it hurts my feelings and it's going to be okay. Well, hey, like Steve Jobs said, it's the weird ones sometimes that that change the world. So (laughs) here's to the weird ones. I think, I think it's, it's very cool though, what you've done. Can you explain a little bit more just for anyone who maybe hasn't uh, seen or they haven't been on the website or anything like that yet? Of course, we'll put all, all of those links and everything in the description, but um, for someone who hasn't seen, tell us about kind of the two stages of of the project and kind of where you're at right now. Yeah, so we opened our original location in September of 21. Um, and so that's just an outdoor only location. That was actually kind of a compromise because we, we acquired the land in the middle of the pandemic and, um, you know, cost of everything kind of went up and also just kind of fear of not knowing the industry. So we kind of tiptoed in there and just built an outdoor location we kind of kept it in the back of our mind like man we really want to come back and build an indoor location eventually so we actually like when we ran utilities kind of set ourselves up for like okay if we ever get there we can just tie in and make it so much easier on ourselves so luckily we did do those things and so now we're at the point we're about halfway through the construction process on building the second location that's indoor Um, All on the same property, we were very fortunate that we found a property that's 80 acres, which is honestly way more than I ever wanted. Um, But now I can't imagine not having it because this land is so special. I also like to tell people that we have the best stargazing views because the the local college's observatory is down the street from us. I'm like, obviously that means that this is the best. So it's probably not, but we don't get a lot of light pollution from the major city um, because we're angled at a different spot. But 
having so much land allowed us to be able to build the two locations on the same property, but they're not visible to each other. And we're also able to kind of take what we learned from the first venue of like, okay, this is how people tend to operate. This is the cadence of the day. These are the things that I've heard, or maybe even the things that I heard that hurt my feelings because I couldn't do anything about it then. And then taking that over into the new location um, and seeing where we can apply that and where it makes sense and feels good to us to do that. And also giving ourselves permission or at least myself permission to go further, like, and to really push the boundaries more. I think that, um, you know, something I was really nervous about in my, in the first venue that we did is just going too far out there with the design choices. You know, our, both of our dressing rooms are very gender neutral. Uh, we do serve a lot of same sex couples and I really want to be like a comfortable space for them. And part of that is not having a super bridally bridal suite. Um, and then going that much further in our new location, like the quote unquote bridal suites, um, you know, it's not going to be called a bridal suite. It's going to have some other fun name I haven't thought of yet, but I'm going with brown walls and really just making it very makeup more than anything, but just going further with that design that I was too afraid to do the first time. I like the creative name idea because you could obviously go, you know, ready rooms. That's very yeah. generic, but also not as fun. As yeah. So, yeah. I mean, our venue, our like our main, well, the other thing too, while we were building our first venue, we didn't have the money to build like a groom suite. So we just had the one dressing room. And since we only had the one, we actually had quite a few couples get ready together. Uh, so we ended up calling it the Dogwood Suite, which worked out really well. And then we came back a year later and built a tree house for the groom suite or whatever. I also have plenty of brides that get ready in there. We just call it the tree house. Uh, I, thought I, we would come up with a bigger, better name for that. I'm like, everyone just calls it the tree house. We'll just keep calling it the tree house. Yeah. Finding, using what people are saying, it is, it, you're going with kind of customer sentiment almost, if you will, yeah. and not needing to fight or try to retrain that every time is huge. Exactly. And also like my favorite, so a couple of things that are like absolutely my favorite of like working in that space when I still work weddings, which at this point is pretty rare that I'm actually the one working weddings, but I love when the grooms and the groomsmen show up because they get so excited about the tree house. They'll be like, yes, we get the tree house and they like run off and like our tree house is like chucked back into the trees too. So you can't really see it, but it's still really close by. And just like seeing that like excitement is so much fun. Um, and then on the other side of when like uh, most people are underneath the pavilion through dinner and everything. And then usually by the time nightfall actually happens is generally the first time that they'll walk out from underneath the pavilion out to a field where we have a fire pit. But seeing people's eyes light up when they see all of the stars is like, oh, if I could bottle that energy, I, I would be the happiest person because like, I, you, it's easy to take for granted those like simple pleasures and those great things. I'm like, that's why we have the venue is that people get to be connected with these really beautiful spaces. And, you know, I think, you know, if I look back to like my own childhood and some of my favorite memories, it's around the fire pit, you know, with, you know, my grandpa or whatever on these camping trips. And now I get to also cultivate that for a lot of people to like, you know, the couple at the end of the night, you know, cuddled up together under a blanket by the fire. Like that's the most beautiful thing. It's it's so true. And that's what events are for. It's what made me and my wife really fall in love with the event industry. It's like it's it's we're doing these things that are once in a lifetime events for people. You know, they're moments of connection, you know, uh, you know, babies are born as a result of it. You know, uh, people are like uh, arguments happen, reunions happen, like all of this life really happens when there's an event. And I was on a podcast with um, uh, uh, David Adler, who's the CEO of BizBash, and and he said the most powerful word in the, in the English language is let's, let us, you know, because it's kind of like a collection of people doing doing something together. And and he said like a rebellion <laughs> and, uh, you know, all, all these different. And so it's and it's so true. We have these opportunities and for beautiful spaces like yours, you get to enjoy that. And that is something that that's why people are coming to the venue and not just spending four hours somewhere, just quickly doing the tying the knot and then leaving. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's where we've tried to separate ourselves too. It was like, you know, there are places where you can just go get married and that's, that's it. And like for some people, that's all they want. And there's nothing wrong with that. I want to cultivate those moments and those memories and also just like setting the foundation to make sure that they know how to do that. Like even just like the simple things of encouraging them, like, okay, after the ceremony, take 15 minutes together alone in the dressing room and just you know, soak it in. So you actually remember the day, you know, how many people have you heard talk about how they don't remember anything that happened on their wedding day? It was a blur and it doesn't have to be that way. Yeah. Don't eat anything. You don't. Yes. No. <laughs> That's, and those are the big ones that everyone knows, but like, yeah, taking those little moments away because you're entertaining. Mm-hmm. You're almost in like operation mode and you, yeah. you don't want to be, because then you do miss it. A hundred percent. So, and it is a beautiful segue into, you know, tell us a little bit of how your packages are structured. How have you thought about your pricing? How have you thought about kind of putting the experience together that the, that the couple gets timing that they get access to the venue for all of that? Yeah. So for us, when we first started, we only did full weekend bookings. Um, and so we started with that and really encouraging people to like camp on site and really make a full weekend of it. Um, but as we launched, you know, we got that feedback that some people like that's too much. Like they don't want to spend that much time with their family. They're wanting like a single day. And so we've kind of incorporated that into like our packages as we've changed and evolved over time that we still have like what we call the 48 hour package. So they get like 11 a.m. on Friday to 11 a.m. on Sunday. So they still get two nights. They still get a lot of time to really like relax into all of those big moments um, but then we also have these single day packages for the people that really just want that day. Um, and, you know, oftentimes still trying to tell them like, hey, maybe don't book your honeymoon flight at 6 a.m. the next day because um, you're not going to enjoy your wedding that way. Um, but ultimately, you, that's uh, up to me. Yeah. You're going to drive to the the airport, the international airport, maybe missing the flight, having to the net. Yeah. <laughs> Like it's enough to remember to like prepare and plan for a wedding. <laughs> Give yourself some like time and space before the honeymoon. But you know, you can only, you can only give advice where it makes sense. Uh, but yeah, like that's kind of just been our focus too. It's just like, you know, we have the single day or like the 48 hour package options um, that we start with. And really we, we dedicate that entire day to them. We don't do tours or anything else during that day. Um, and now, you know, after a few years of working these events too, that, you know, I now have a team that works with me. Um, So I've got one person that'll work in the morning until about four o'clock. And then the next person will pick up about four o'clock and work until the, until the event ends. So they always have a person that can help them problem solve, that can answer questions, that can just be a supportive person. Um, I actually just had my like new hire orientation last week and I now have like six part-time people working with me, which blows my mind like that's crazy that's a lot of fun but also a lot of pressure i had to like figure out payroll and, like that's a whole like ne- it's like a whole new level of business ownership that like i'm leveling up you know um but one of the things that i spend a lot of time preparing my new hires for is that sometimes people are gonna be really into you the day of your wedding like the you know the mom of the bride or whoever and it literally has nothing to do with you like people are stressed they're, you know, they're at decision fatigue, all of those things. So kind of giving them the tools to kind of navigate and handle that without breaking down and crying because people are mean. And then a couple hours later, they're super apologetic and feel super bad that they were ever that way. But they were just, you know, stressed about the wedding and they really just wanted to make it perfect for, you know, the couple. And it just, you were the safe person to get out on because you weren't a family member or a friend. You were just this anonymous third party and like, it has nothing to do with you. And like, that took so long for me to get. And I was like, you need to know this from day one. Like, before you start working events, like, it's not about you. Like, and that, that's so hard to learn until you're there. And also just knowing like your own triggers of like, okay, maybe the father daughter dance is a little too heavy for you. Maybe that's a good time to go check the bathrooms. Mm-hmm. Like, protect yeah. yourself to that. I, I was going to ask you, where does that come from for you? Because this is the second time you've mentioned something similar. And the theme that I heard both times is not taking it personally. And you've said that you've <laughs> worked through it, but in both, you're, now you're training your team. You're passing those lessons. Mm-hmm. Where does that come from? 
I actually do think it kind of comes from being a technical writer um, and just kind of the training and education that they that I went through in that of kind of like it was so much focused on knowing your audience and knowing, you know, the intent of the language and like and it take and I think it took me a couple of times of really getting my feelings hurt and like really just feeling my heart ripped off my chest because I couldn't fix everybody's problems. I couldn't be everything to every person. And so many weddings, I was working 15, 16 hour days doing everything I could to make it a perfect day and still couldn't fix everything. Um, and so I think it took that time to kind of go back and be like, okay, what, why, why is this happening? What is this, you know, what, is, where are they coming from? Who, you know, what perspective are they coming from? It took a lot of that kind of, you know, investigation to really start to bring that to light to me, uh, for me to then be able to like talk about that and realize like, okay, and now I can prepare brides for that or my team for that of like, that's just a part of it. And like, we can work through that. And like, I think if you're aware, you know, it makes it so it takes away a lot of the power of those feelings and those uncomfortable feelings. If you know the source. That's, that's so powerful. There's almost what we're describing is almost a detachment from mm-hmm. making the problem personal. And, yeah. and I, I think just like you said, there's levels to the business. Now you have the six, six part-time people and things like that. I, I've experienced that even in times where payroll's extremely tight. You know, some, mm-hmm. some, you know, we'll do, oh man, this year we'll do maybe 700,000 in payroll. Wow. The year. And there are some months that are closer than others, right? But you yeah. can dramatically increase your quality of life by detaching from the problem and looking at the business like a business that you run, not you are the business. And yeah, everything is a reflection on you and your character and all of that. Exactly. Yeah. And it, it, that's a hard place to get to. And I think you almost have to personally go through some of those roadblocks and those those feelings before you can really step away. But I can either let this defeat me and like my business is over and like this is so awful and whatever. Or you can learn to walk away like how how can I show up differently next time or you know, how do I set better boundaries with this situation? But also like for me, like, you know, when I got into some of these bad situations, I had one wedding last year that they were just so upset. We didn't have walls. I was like, it's pavilion. Like we don't have walls. We've never had walls. Like, and they were just so mad. And I was finally to the point. I was like, I will give you all of your money back. If you just leave, like you're so angry, you're so mad, you're screaming at me. Like, I don't like this kind of treatment. I was like, I give you all your money, just leave. Um, they ultimately ended up staying and like, they just took down all of the decor and like, it turned out really just fine. Like, and it was just like, that was the moment of like, okay, how, how am I preparing people for this day? Like, okay, so right now I have open houses. I'm giving them PDFs and like links to like, here's all the information about the venue. And then it was in that moment, I realized there's so many times where you know, a bride is preparing for a wedding day, but is actually handing off all of the tasks to like a mom or an aunt or somebody. And they're not getting all the information that I'm giving out. Uh, and so it, that jogged the idea of like, oh, I need to create like a printed version of this and like a, almost like a magazine of like, okay, I'm going to mail this to you and you can hand it off to aunt so-and-so. And now they know all of the dimensions, all of the rules, all of the limitations and then I know that I've done everything in my power. I have hit this at all angles to prepare them for success. And whether they take that or not is no longer up to me. You know, I've hit every single possible avenue at that point. And if it's still not enough, all I can do is say, I'm sorry that I couldn't meet your expectations, but that's it. Mindy, that's brilliant. The the printed version, because like, I think a lot of us, in the wedding industry have gone the, I mean, we've done print for more marketing materials. Yeah. Operationally, maybe we've gone digital or just we know it and we've passed it along, you know, mm-hmm. I, I tell you and now you're going to know kind of sort of thing. But printing those things out and then, like you said, mailing them or giving them, then it's like, yeah. hey, look, look in the book. It's almost like a bunch of FAQs and things like that, that you don't have to have someone opening like a Google document and then, oh, am I signed it with the right Gmail? And then, are the right. sharing correct and all that yeah and it's like it took that wedding of like oh my gosh i never want to go through this again 
Um, and, uh, and like for me too, I was sitting back in that situation. Like I actually had to like, I've never had a wedding cry make me cry before that wedding, but that one totally made me cry. I had to go hide um, and like run over to my husband. I was like, this is, I can't do this. I can't make these people happy. Like I felt like I did everything I could to help these people like have a great wedding day. Like that was the point. And, um, and it was like, okay, what avenues am I giving them information? What are the gaps there? How can I make sure this never happens again? Or at least I know how to respond next time and be like, look, I provided you this information in printed form. I gave you links to this. I've had multiple open houses that you've been invited to. At that point, you're not happy with the fact that we don't have walls. I don't know what else to do for you. Like this just wasn't a fit for you to begin with. Yeah. Yeah. How, how did the team members come about? Like kind of give me the evolution. Cause you said you're in your, you've done four years. We just started our fourth season. So three years basically. Okay. Um, our very first season was only like six weeks and we had like four weddings that very first, um, opening season, I guess. Okay. In, and you said Southwestern Missouri, uh, mm-hmm. where, what's your seasonality like in that area? Yeah. So our outdoor locations only open from April until November. Um, most of our weddings happen in like the traditional like peak months of the May, June, September, October. We still have some scattered in there in the summer, but because we're outdoor only, we don't do a ton in the like July and August months, but I also don't want to do a ton in those months anyways, uh, cause it's super hot and it's like hard to make people happy when they're uncomfortably hot. Um, but yeah, so I decided to go, like, I kind of fallen into having some help in the past. Like, it was like past bridesmaids and whatnot that are like, oh, if you ever need someone, need help working weddings for you, um, that would just come at, like, so I've had a few of those people um, join in the past. Um, but this year, I, I approached it very intentionally of like, okay, we're running into like these issues. These issues would not happen if somebody was here 100% of the time that the couple and like their families are on site. Um, and so I just built that into my pricing that, you know, I know what it costs to keep people employed in these jobs, but also, you know, going through some of like my own experiences in corporate, I, it was really important to me that not only could I be innovative in the wedding industry and offer something a little bit differently, but I I really felt the strong pull to also be a really good leader and to have that, you know, to really start training the next team because it's, It's not just about me with this wedding venue. And at first I was really scared because so many of the first couples, like, you know, the very first bride that got married at our place is a very good friend of mine now. And like we connected because of that. I was so scared to like walk away and not be that person anymore. I felt like I would let them down. And then I had the first couple of weddings and I was like, oh, they don't notice. They don't even care that I'm not the one there. And like, okay, yeah, like I was way too much in my ego on that. And so it's like, okay, I just need to bring some people in so I can do the operational and the marketing things and like also be a really good leader to them and help coach them through how to handle these situations. And, you know, I don't care if they work for me for, you know, just a couple months or for 10 years or whatever. I want them to leave knowing like what it means to be treated really well and also how to help kind of you talk to people like, okay, on a wedding day, they're in the mindset of decision fatigue. How can I change how I ask, you know, a couple of questions um, or ask questions to the couple and the wedding party that doesn't add to that decision fatigue and coach them through how to do those things. And that feels really good to me and like feels like the logical next step of like, okay, like that's, that's my place now is that I get to really lead that next group of people and also show them what it means to be treated really well and have a good manager. And like, that's what I strive for every single day. I love that. I love that. That's, that's so cool to see the evolution and just your ability to have more leverage really, because the teams that you're helping coach are now able to affect all of those weddings and you're going to continue doing that. And in a way that maybe you wouldn't be able to as much if you were doing everything your own because you just be focused you know on on getting the thing right ahead of you done it's yeah creative. my husband called me out the other day he's like why are you not more confident in the venue and like what you've accomplished and what you've done and I was like because I look around and I see all the things not done and I'm worried that somebody's gonna know that something's not done but it really like nobody knows what's in my head like I logically know that Uh, But it's really hard to still be confident and like, oh, yeah, like 
I've got like a million things on my to-do list of like, oh yeah, this this junk corner in the back of the venue that nobody sees. Like I want to organize it. I want to clean it. I want to make it look better, especially before all my new hires start and like need to put their stuff back there. Like that's the part that like grates on me and makes me feel not as confident about my venue as I should feel. Um, but I'm not, I don't have time for those things if I'm working every single wedding. Um, Cause those are, yeah, easily 15 hour days. You said something in the very beginning, actually before, I think it was before we started recording um, that I wanted to, to circle back to. We were talking about how difficult that, how difficult it can be to, to run a venue, to own a venue and how, you know, people in different Facebook groups at various times, maybe you're, you know, saying like, oh, it's a great retirement business. And, you know, it's, um, it's one of those things that is very all encompassing. Um, mm-hmm. Can you give me a little bit of your experience like year one, that first season, right? Now you're in your third third year, you said. Um, as those seasons have gone out, what have your bookings looked like? Because, and, and I'll give you some context for the, the question. Um, I am curious about kind of the booking numbers, but I think there may be a misconception for specifically new venue owners that you're going to get in. Year one, you're going to have 60 weddings. Year two, you're going to have 120 and year three, depending on your seasonality, you're going to have 180 and then you'll maybe just keep doing 180 weddings, you know, for forever, right? Yeah. And I think really like approaching those numbers with the thought of like what actually feels good to you. Like, you know, for some people, you know, just doing one wedding a weekend is all that they want to in those prime months because they feel like they can give it their all to those weddings and like really show up intentionally. And like, I think I even heard one of your past um, podcast episodes, like it's what they do is just one uh, wedding a weekend. And that feels really good. I do like to do more than that. Uh, but it did start very slow. Our, our first season was only six weeks, the very end of September through October. We had four weddings in that time period and like a couple of wedding showers and uh, we had quite a few yoga classes, that sort of thing, just kind of trying to get our name out there. And like that felt like so many, like, cause like, oh, we have to know like what kind of, you know, materials do you need to stock? What, what kind of questions do I need to be prepared for? Like what's going to happen here? Like it takes so much mental energy to prep and then to like, you know, finish up afterwards. And like the conversation I often have with photographers who want to do styled shoots, it's like, those days are actually more work for me than an actual wedding, just the amount of like setup, clean up, all of that. Stuff. Um, and so just kind of knowing of like what feels good and like what growth makes sense. Uh, where we're at in Southwest Missouri is extremely saturated. Uh, while we were building in our first venue, like there was venues popping up left and right. You can practically throw a rock and hit a venue uh, right now area. That's good for the customer. Like that's good for the couples because they have those choices. And so while I think if I were to open my venue up in a different area, you know, I might be looking at like a hundred weddings a year as being successful. And, but that might also be a more expensive area to operate in where here we are in Southwest Missouri, the cost of living, the land costs, the construction costs are so much lower here to where like my goal can be 50 and that still hit the numbers feel really good to me and to also like the limitations of the land and all of that. Do you feel like it's limited? So you said year one, you did, you said four with the <laughs> area plus, you know, auxiliary events. Did that increase uh, dramatically? So your kind of your inventory number, if you will, if you think of like inventory in terms of dates is, is 50. Is that kind of the number that you're trying to hit at in terms of maybe be fully booked or is it more? Yeah, that's definitely like where I feel like the max of what our outdoor location can do, just the amount of like good seasonal weather. Cause I mean, here in Missouri, like the weather changes so fast. We have really hot summers. Um, the winters haven't been as cold, but still like the risk of ice storms are pretty, um, significant in our winters. So I have to kind of keep that in mind. So really like the spring and the fall months are, our number. So like 50 is a really good goal and realistic goal. We ended up hitting that in our second full year. We were just at like 48 weddings um, and that felt really good. And, you know, we'll hit about that again this year. And I think that's kind of where it tops out for us. Um, and like, that's really where I want it in the new location that we're building. I don't know exactly where I want to set the goals, expectations in it. Um, you know, of course I have some like ideas in mind just because of like lender, you know, payment, you know, all of that stuff of where I want it to be. But what feels good is probably more important to me than like this 
certain number goal. Mm-hmm. That's, that's but I don't know that until I know that. <laughs> so, fair enough. Fair enough. Until you get into the space. Yeah, there's so much to talk about here. And I mean, we're not even going to be able to fully, fully get into it today. But, you know, depending on how you're approaching the venue, like you said at the beginning, there's no like absolute one way to, mm-hmm. to run your venue. And that's one of the things that I've seen, you know, with the venues, we're, we're, um, believe it or not, going on nine venues and they're in wow. different states and there's different demographics and, very quickly we realized that we can't be dogmatic about like this one way that we're going to force everything into we've got to be willing to be flexible you might have people that feel it feels really right to only do one wedding per weekend and they're going to do 18 weddings a year and that could be extremely successful for them right exactly yeah yep. yeah i think too like when i entered the wedding industry, I got so caught up in those numbers that I would see in like the the wedding Facebook groups and all of that. And like thinking like that was a reasonable expectation of myself or what I should aim for. It really took me actually operating the business to determine for me, like what is my success criteria? And it not isn't necessarily tied to a specific number booking. Um, and I would really encourage other venue owners too to kind of tie other success criteria uh, of what looks good. And also, you know, that was part of my decision to hire more people to help work these events is like, you know, that is part of my success criteria is that I am employing people and like that feels good and I can pay them really well for our market. And like, so I want to hire really good people into good jobs. And that might mean that I need to book a couple of extra weddings a year and, you know, using that to kind of ebb and flow um, through your goals. This is Man, we're going to talk, talk about this. <laughs> this is a whole topic. You know, it's so that what you said is really, really profound because I think people get in and they first think they first go numbers. And, and I, without that's correct, I think in some senses, because if you're getting an SBA loan or you have some other, you know, you maybe you have an investor, maybe you've saved up money, regardless of how you funded the deal, you, you do have to think about your numbers from that standpoint. But if you're just considering that, you know, the payment and you're not considering the type of lifestyle you want. You're not considering some of those other things. You may not budget in money for a team and you've yeah. created a really, you know, a very, uh, difficult full-time double-time job for yourself. Right. Yeah. I mean, like if you just wanted to work per hour, go get a corporate job, you'd save yourself a lot of headaches. Yeah. You know, I think, you know, to to take the risk and to go further into like business ownership and specifically venue ownership, you have to be a little crazy and a little bit of a trailblazer to take on some of those risks and to also be able to say like, okay, I can let my numbers inform me of how I should price my venues and kind of, you know, use the matrix of like, okay, this is what my competitors are doing and this is how it compares to my cost of operation and um, but then really going into like, how is this cultivating the life that I actually want to live and what is important to me? We, I like that you use the term success criteria and I'm, I'm going to noodle on that a little bit and see if that's <laughs> one I incorporate into our trainings, because, you know, we talk a lot about KPIs and we, we've hired mm-hmm. some consultants over the years, KPIs, not just being key performance indicators, but profit indicators, process indicators, uh, procedural indicators, like wh- mm-hmm. what? What are the indicators that a certain procedure is working? What is a profit indicator that, that the business is making the return that we expect? Um, yeah. And so, but success criteria, like, and that's going to be different for everyone. Exactly. And I'm like, and so as a project manager and like, that's the primary work that I've been doing leading up to this. And like, I have my master's in project management, the PMP certification, all those like fancy titles. And like, they really just kind of drill in that idea of like, what does it mean to have a successful project and lead people to that? And what kind of information do you need to get them there and support them through that journey? And like, and then you get to take that over into like couples and like they have their own little micro project. Um, but then also like taking that into like how I operate my business. Like I make the choice that I do not have a decor closet. That is a little weird in my area. Every other venue pretty much has a decor closet. I don't see how that makes any sense. I don't want to do it and I'm not doing it. Um, but that's okay. And I know I lose bookings for it. Uh, I'm also more than happy to be like, Hey, 
you can go down the road to this event rental company and I can keep prices, you know, $100 cheaper because I'm out of this and I don't want to have it. But and it's and it's an all in pricing because it's not sometimes I think people don't realize is there is a cost to you managing and upkeeping that inventory. It's it's not just kind of creating a look like uh, experience or situation in the venue down the road, but it's also like you're going to have to mm-hmm. keep that up. You're going to have to, yeah. So, go ahead. I was just going to say, like, and that's part of my success criteria too, is that each wedding gets to look like their love story, and by having a bunch of these like, is and the you know all of the decor elements to kind of go into their, um, it then becomes of their love story it becomes less personal to them it became an item of convenience because we have it and so i'll keep my prices you know a few hundred dollars less than i could be charging to know that they could go spend that on marketplace or with the event rental company or wherever to make it look more authentic to them i love i love that mandy i want to wrap today by asking you we've kind of been talking about about this a little bit but how do you feel the wedding industry has changed you know, over the seasons that you've been in business and coming at it from a project management standpoint, kind of, kind of some of the success criteria that you're looking at, you've made some strategic decisions to optimize for quality of life and business experience, as well as what kind of, you said, feels right at the venue, right? How does that, and what's your experience so far cross-referencing that with what the market is telling you and the weddings that are, the venues that are popping up all over the place and marriage rates that are not necessarily, it's not like more and more people every year getting married. It's just about the same, but yeah. now there's more demand of more venues or I'm sorry, more supply, same static demand. What, what do you feel those effects? Do you feel like there's some X factor that you're using that maybe kind of, uh, inures you from that? Yeah. I mean, I think because we entered into the market in 2021, I don't know what normal is before the pandemic. I don't have that frame of reference. I only have the reference of like, we had the big boom of weddings right after the pandemic. And then supposedly this year is a lull, but I don't know. I'm feeling pretty good about this year. Um, You know, I'm very fortunate in that. Um, But I think it's, you know, in the fact that there are a lot of venues and like that was something that was very scary to us as we were building our first location is that so many others were kind of popping up. But I think a lot have um, kind of approached it from the, you know, if we build it, they will come kind of perspective. Um, You know, they, you know, they'll put up a website, but then forget about it. They'll, you know, kind of do social media or they'll hire a social media company that doesn't look and sound like them. It's just, here's images of the wedding venue. Cool. Why is that? Why is anybody going to follow you for that? You know, I, you need to tell your story and be a part of it. And, you know, hiring, you know, there might be a good social media company out there for you to hire, but doesn't mean that they're really the right fit if they're not telling your story. And like, that's how you can stand out in your market of like, stay true to yourself and like, but also don't forget to come back and actually market it. Um, and like, that doesn't mean just showing up every six months at a wedding show that's showing up regularly and on social media or on your website, keeping that fresh and updated and all of that. And I think that's what's helped us kind of like stand above our competition, but also kind of giving people the permission, like as they tour, you know, encouraging them like, Hey, there's a lot of venues out here. I don't want you to ever settle. Find the one that feels best for you. And if you, you know, have questions after you've booked another venue and like you just need to know a good florist and you see that we grow a lot of plants, I'm happy to make those recommendations for you. Like we can't approach this in this scarcity mindset of like, we're going to run out of couples. Like, no, we, we need to innovate. Like we just have to keep doing something a little bit better. How do we show up better as ourselves, but also as something new and fresh in the industry and like helping couples really connect with that? And sometimes those are little changes. Sometimes those are big changes. And it takes really kind of thinking about yourself and what you want your business to represent to really bring that all together. That's awesome. That's that's so good. Well, Mandy, thank you so much for coming on the show today. This was really a treat. And I uh, loved, loved chatting, loved hearing about your experience and just how how you've been able to to grow this thing from you know a dream and something you've really been excited about and just excited to hear how Juniper Gardens is growing. And so, yeah, thanks for, thanks for coming on the show today. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, my pleasure. 
if someone does want to reach out, what's the best way for them? Is it Instagram? Is it the, the website? What's the best way? Yeah, I mean, they all kind of go to my phone at the same time. So Instagram's probably the easiest, but there's also a contact form on the website. And yeah, I would love to, I'd love to chat. If any other video owners just need to like talk about design, I could talk about that until I'm blue in the face. Um, and really just any of that stuff. It's really fun to kind of, you know, help other venue owners to like figure out what feels good to them. Amazing. Awesome. Well, thanks again for being on the show. This was, this was great. <laughs> Thank you. Have a great rest of your day. Hey there, thanks so much for watching or listening. I wanted to take a moment and share about Common Sense Events. Common Sense Events is my company that professionally manages and operates venues all across the United States, and we're looking to work with a couple more venues this year. If you own a venue in Tennessee, Alabama, Georgia, Texas, North Carolina, we are looking to work with you. Our company comes in and takes care of the marketing, the sales, the operations, we hire all of the employees, we manage all the employees, and primarily our agreements are based off of revenue share models. So it's a very affordable way to have your venue professionally managed. And this is especially good if you're thinking about retiring, selling your venue, but maybe you don't want to sell the land, or you're looking for another management option that you currently have in place. If you're interested in this, please reach out by email at venues at cseventservices.com, or you can also click the link in the description of this video or podcast. We'd love to hear from you and look forward to seeing if there's a way for us to serve you.